So Piers Morgan, the insider, what a reaction. <laughs> there were just so many fantastic comments and so many questions. So I've got some really good stories to tell you from that book and I'll get onto that very quickly. But there were just a few little questions to clear up. Mainly the questions were about Sarah Ferguson, Duchess of York. Now the answers I'm going to give were actually out of Sarah's own mouth so I don't think I'm speaking out of turn clarifying with those words. So the reason why Diana and Sarah actually had a falling out before Diana's death, they hadn't actually spoken for nearly a year before her death and Diana had cut off all contact, including all the contact that Sarah had with William and Harry. Now it was over the fact that Sarah had put in her book that she'd caught warts off Diana when she borrowed her shoes, planned to warts, or as she said in her book, Veruca. And Diana didn't take very kindly to that, which honestly, I don't blame her. I think if my bestie said they caught warts off me after borrowing my shoes, I think I would be sort of eyeing her a bit warily. The other thing was that in Sarah's book, she admits her again, her own words, that she did praise up the then Prince Charles. Now, in the context of their friendship, that wasn't probably what Diana was expecting. They'd agreed to divorce together. They'd agreed to get out of the royal family together. Diana was separated, not divorced yet. But Fergie was sort of pushed out a little ahead of schedule because of all the sort of scandals that befell her at the time. Now, Diana would have seen it as a complete betrayal, I think, as any girlfriend to girlfriend interaction would if you started praising up their soon to be ex husband. Other people have also been saying to me, well, she only had a few, you know, lunches and dinners with Piers Morgan. So how can you say that she actually betrayed secrets of the royal family? Well, I'm not saying that. I, I just sort of thought that it could be a possibility. But there is one aspect that I didn't share that I think I should share seeing that I was questioned. And that was that these were monthly. Because at one stage in his book, Piers Morgan does say that Fergie was late for our monthly lunch today. So I rest my case. So I'm going to tell you a really intriguing story from Piers Morgan's book, The Insider, and it's about the cad. Yes, James Hewitt, the one who broke Diana's heart and betrayed her by telling everyone about their intimate affair. Now, I'm not going to make any excuses for James Hewitt, but I am just going to qualify that by saying after reading this book, I realise that unless you walk in that person's shoes, it's a bit hard to judge because you can see how their integrity is just chipped away by these very determined tabloid newspaper editors who want them to tell everything. Now, Piers Morgan, to get a little bit closer to James Hewitt, had employed a reporter and his name is Phil Taylor. He was from another publication called Sunday People. Now, his attraction to Piers Morgan, then editor of News of the World, was the fact that he had forged a relationship with James Hewitt. He had got quite close to James Hewitt and James Hewitt was starting to really trust this guy. So Phil Taylor, to earn his right to be employed by News of the World, set up a meeting. Now, this meeting was going to be in a hotel suite in Kensington, and it was going to be with Piers Morgan as the editor of News of the World, the then deputy editor, and Rebecca Wade, who you will know as Rebecca Brooks. Now, I wouldn't want to meet that trio, would you? I mean, really, you would have to be really prepared to walk into a room with that little toxic trio waiting for you. They went ahead to the hotel suite to prepare it before the interview. Now, they didn't prepare it by making sure there was tasty snacks and fine wine. No, they prepared it by putting tape recorders all around the room in flower pots, lying in wait for James Hewitt. And their thinking was that if he didn't agree to a tell-all interview scoop with News of the World, then they would be able to get him anyway, because they would have him on tape considering the idea of betraying Diana. 
So when James Hewitt walks into this news of the world trap, he proceeds to have a bit of a conversation. £500,000 were offered to him for the tell-all interview. Now, he was a little bit interested, seemingly, because he did ask for clarification. He asked, well, what would I need to say for that? What sort of level of detail would you need? And he was told in no uncertain terms that for that amount of money, he would have to spill the beans, baby. He would have to tell them every intimate detail of their love affair. Now, he didn't make any commitments and he got up and he was on his way out and Piers Morgan makes a jokey comment that I'm paraphrasing where he says, you know, James, if you were smart, you could write your own book and make a million. And James Hewitt reportedly looked at Piers Morgan at that point rather thoughtfully and then he left. Well, the joke's on News of the World because three or four months later they found out that James Hewitt had indeed written a secret book and it was only 48 hours away from appearing in bookshops. Now, as you can imagine, News of the World management team and Piers Morgan in particular didn't like being treated like that. They don't like it when their, <laughs> their targets show any initiative and so they decided to do a full page splash, preempting this and exposing James Hewitt. So a few years later, Piers Morgan's jump ship, he's now editor of The Mirror, and he gets a chance to exact revenge on James Hewitt. And he found out that James Hewitt was going to do yet another tell all interview, but this time on TV for money. And so you know what he does? He publishes. James Hewitt's number plate, he publishes his home address and his home phone number. And he encourages over a million mirror readers to contact James Hewitt and tell him what they think of him. So these days, I don't think anyone would get away with that. But back in the day, they did. Now, Piers Morgan dodged a few bullets. There was other scandals with James Hewitt. The Sun actually got caught. There was a video going around and it apparently showed Diana and James Hewitt having a semi-naked romp, as it was described. And Piers Morgan was really worried that he'd miss this scoop. He just didn't have it. Turns out that it was lucky he dodged a bullet because it was a fake video. Now, the final bit in the James Hewitt saga was actually a year after Diana died. Now, Diana died, as you know, August 1997. And in 1998, Anna Ferretti, who was then James Hewitt's fiance, approaches the editor of The Mirror with love letters that Diana had written to James Hewitt. Now, Anna Ferretti said she got a few of these out of his safe in his home in Devon. Now, we don't know to this day whether James Hewitt knew about it or whether she actually just stole them without his knowledge. I don't really know. So Piers Morgan realises very quickly that he's not going to be able to really publish these letters. But he thought, oh, well, I'll get something out of it. So he offers Anna Ferretti £150,000 if she goes home and gets all of the letters and brings them back. And his plan was that he was going to do a scoop exposing her selling the letters. And then he was going to make a big deal out of heroically delivering Diana's love letters to Kensington Palace which is really a load of cods more because Diana was already dead and the rightful owner of the letters were the person that she sent them to, which was James Hewitt. But anyway, we'll ignore all that, as Piers Morgan seems to. And it went ahead. And to his dismay, in 1999, uh, Kensington Palace decided to return all those love letters to James Hewitt and he couldn't work out why. In his journal, he said, why did they do that? Well, Piers, I guess they didn't want to have stolen goods in their possession. I guess they realised that they needed to return these stolen goods to the rightful recipient. I guess that's why, why they did that. I'm going to finish up with a bit of opinion. I don't often shove my opinion down your neck <laughs> and I'm not going to now because I can't really take the moral high ground because I'm obviously relishing sharing these really juicy stories from Piers Morgan's book. But I will say this, 
that in the 80s and 90s, it didn't seem to me that newspapers were about the fourth estate honourably holding people of power to account. It was nothing like that. It was the Wild West. You know, they held salacious, gossipy and sometimes extremely damaging stories that they had gathered via nefarious means and they held them over people's heads, even democratically elected people's heads, in order to get what they want, in order to get them to say what they wanted them to say and in order to get them to comply with whatever they wanted, basically. And the Press Complaints Commission at the time was a complete toothless tiger. It was really ridiculous. I mean, Piers Morgan even reiterates that when he was with News of the World, that Rupert Murdoch made a big hairy deal about supposedly telling him off for appalling behaviour while secretly telling him, good on you, mate, keep on going, you're doing a good job. So, you know, it's all sorted, it's all awful. Now, Piers Morgan himself even seems a little bit uncomfortable throughout this book because he does get paralytically drunk on many occasions. Now, this could be a form of self-medication, maybe trying to drown out the howls of his own conscience. I have no idea, but only Piers could tell us that one. But I can say that I have experienced a little bit of this by running this small channel. If you haven't met me before, my name's Shauna and I do deep dives into books and interviews and documentaries, anything that interests my community. And in the course of that, I have come across bits of information that if shared, I could have an instant viral video. I could just launch my channel with some of the things that I have stumbled across. But if I was to do that, then someone else would be paying the price. So I guess what I'm saying is, I don't think I would be very successful working for someone like Rupert Murdoch. What about you? Where are your moral goalposts? Let me know in the comments down below and I'll see you again very soon. Bye.